Hey, it's Darcy McConvey, and this is the Venture and Gains podcast. The purpose of the show is to connect people to other great people, ideas, and opportunities. Everyone has less than a handful of people in their network where it seems like there's something different about them. Everything they touch seems to turn to gold, and they're those can't miss people, and you just know it. These are the podcast guests. We catch them at various stages of their career, learn from how they think, so you can connect the dots and imply it. Norm is a guru. There's no other way to put it. He covers a lot in this conversation, and some of the things that drew me in are the idea as to what separates great producers from average producers. For high performers, the big separator is the time frame in which they think. Framing the long game, the infinite game, and your game. It's interesting how tweaks in language can be so powerful. For example, referrals versus introductions and mastering the art of retaining introductions. One of my favorite parts of the conversation is the can't miss section on mastering the client attraction conversation and the fascinating take on how you answer the question, what do you do? Finally, how technology is changing the conversation when it comes to prospects particularly. When people make decisions, they triangulate using intuition, word of mouth, and Google. His voice is soothing and he offers a ton of insight. So here we go with Norm Trainer. Welcome back. I'm super excited to have uh, our guest today on the Venture and Gains podcast, Norm Trainer. Norm is a uh, executive coach extraordinaire with a, a long history in the industry. And you'll see by the podcast that he's, he's exceptional in what he does. So Norm, welcome. Thank you, Darcy, and uh, thank you for your kind words. Well, I've got to start on a on an uplifting note, right? Get you <laughs> get you a little bit get you a little bit motivated. The less kind words come later. So you've been working with leaders of industry for for a long time, and one of the things that I think is is always interesting to learn about is what differentiates. What's the biggest differentiator that separates? the good from the greatest or the good from the great? Well, that, that's a question we get asked quite often, Darcy. Uh, you know, what differentiates the highest performers from average producers? When you ask a high performer what makes them so effective, they will readily tell you. However, when you observe what makes them successful, it is usually not what they tell you. When high performers look at their success or, or what led to their achievements, uh, They often focus on their product technical capabilities, their influence or charisma with others or sales skills, uh, the the quality and depth of their network. All of those things are important. That is not what differentiates them. The single most important differentiator is the time frame or the time span within which people plan and work. In other words, high performers plan their work and work their plan very differently than average performers. And that relates to the longest task in which they're involved. And typically for a successful executive or leader or entrepreneur, it's building a sustainable and scalable business and the way in which they manage short complex tasks. So for example, if you're in sales, that's often a short complex task. You are managing the sales process. It may take a matter of hours, days, weeks, or months, or in some instances, even years. But the way in which high performers deal with the longest task and short complex tasks is very different. They they tend to focus on the long game. And and entrepreneurs, or sorry, high performers, uh, including entrepreneurs, uh, differentiate themselves in the way in which they play three games. So one is the long game. They're, They're building an enterprise or or building a career five, 10, 20, 30 years out. That's one point of differentiation. But the other differentiation, and it ties back to this capability of thinking longer term, is they also play the infinite game. They recognize that the mantra today is you have to do it yourself and you can't do it alone. And so in a sense, what they do is leverage the time, the energy, the creativity, and the intelligence of others 
to free them up to work at the highest level of their capability. And then the third differentiator is your game. High performers know that each of us is uniquely suited to do one particular aspect or one key element that makes us so successful. So they focus not on comparing themselves to others, but on what they are uniquely suited to do. They play their game. So it's really primarily in terms of one differentiator time frame, but within that, those three games are the long game, the infinite game, and your game. So why do you think that most of these successful or high performing advisors? So, you know, we'll get into the bulk of your practice focuses on financial services and, and financial advisor sort of businesses, and you can go into more detail later on. But wh- why do you think that they don't recognize it's a time frame thing? Is it more because they just think it's their personal charisma and charm that gets them gets them to where they are? Well, I think uh, it's it's one of those uh, aspects of um, uh, of who we are that that we tend often to have blind spots or or not fully appreciate what makes us so effective or so unique. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, in uh, the summer of 2007, a former client of mine reached out to me. He'd just been appointed the chief operating officer of one of the largest real estate development companies in North America. And he said to me, Norm, I'd like you to come in and do a strategic planning session for, for our executive team. And I said, be glad to do that. What's the history of the firm in doing strategic planning? And he said, we've never done it. And I said, why is that? And he said, well, the CEO doesn't believe in it. And I said, well, maybe I should meet with a CEO first before we do the session, because I don't want this to be a career limiting decision on your part. So I met with a CEO and uh, their office uh, is in a, one of the big towers in downtown Toronto. And from the window of the CEO's office, uh, in the ground was a multi-billion dollar project in which they were involved. And it spanned a whole city block. And uh, I said to him, I understand you don't believe in strategic planning. And he said, that's right. And I said, well, tell me about that. And he said, well, you really can't foresee the future more than two years out. Well, as you know, Darcy, that's not what strategic planning is about. It's about scenario planning. There are three axioms of effective planning. The better the assumptions, the better the plan, the more detailed the planning, the better. And the more that your planning is rooted in historical experience, the more likely it is to occur going forward. So uh, I said to him, well, would you mind if I asked you a few questions? And he said, no, not at all. I said, when did you start assembling the land for that project uh, that we can see from your window? And he said, 1987. I said, when did you start getting the approvals and arranging the financing? Early 2000s. When did you break ground? 2006. When will it be completed? Probably around 2010. When do you expect it to be cash flow positive? We're projecting the fall of 2012. That's a 25 year time horizon. Thought about that for a moment and said, I get your point. And we did strategic planning. So often when, when we have a gift, when, when it's intuitive or, or it comes innately to us, we, we tend not to, to fully appreciate it. And so we, don't, we right. don't examine it. And so we tend to attribute our success to things that are more relevant in the moment or more obvious. So, you know, I've asked this question to to someone else that's in a similar line of, of business. Like, that's a great example how you can get sort of the top of the house to agree. You kind of walk them through a scenario and the light bulb goes off. But how do you get, you know, sometimes alpha males are coming from, you know, a private equity background or, you know, a lot, a lot of times they're, they are the smartest people in the room and, and if that's the case, sometimes I'm guessing they would look at an advisor coming in, giving them sort of a strategic plan or coaching as not valuable. So how do you, how do you tackle that or not worth their time or, you know, whatever the reason, how do you tackle that sort of hurdle or that resistance? Well, it's a great question that, uh, uh, it, when, 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 uh, when we meet, by the way, sorry, I don't mean to jump in and cut you off. I said alpha males, but 
it could also be alpha females. <laughs> you know, I should, I should, uh, it doesn't have to be alpha either, I guess, as I cover all my bases here. But, uh, <laughs> Well, I think you get my, my it's drift. It's nice to see you uh, are a sensitive male. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, there we go. When, when, when we meet someone for the first time, there, there are two principles of influence. The first is focus on the other person. Make them the center of the experience. And the second is you earn the right to proceed. Buying is a series of micro decisions. And or whether you're selling an idea, selling a product, selling a service, or selling yourself, you, you have to take people through a series of decision points. And, and one of the first is you have to establish your credibility. You have to demonstrate that you're trustworthy, that, that, that people feel comfortable with you. And, and, and trustworthiness is really about intent. Do they perceive that your intent is, is mutually beneficial, that your interest is aligned with their interest? You, you have to establish that you're credible, that, that, that you understand their business. You, ha you have to be relatable. You, you have to, to make a connection to them and you have to be likable. And uh, so in working with uh, very successful people, and, and that's who we work with, we work with people who are already successful. So one of the paradoxes of our work is people often say, um, why, why would someone who's as successful as the clients with whom you work want a coach? And, and yet we know that the greatest athletes in the world have a number of coaches. You know, LeBron James has a coach, has a number of coaches. Uh, anyone that you can think of who's a great athlete. Uh, so it, it's not at all paradoxical. It's quite natural. But coming back to your, your question, uh, it, it, you really have to make the experience about them. And, and fundamentally, when people judge you, particularly uh, highly effective people, they will typically look at or look for four qualities. So one is integrity. Uh, be on time. Do what you say you're going to do. Finish what you start. Acknowledge others. The second is humility. People generally don't uh, appreciate arrogance. There's very little that's redeeming about arrogance. So it, it's understanding that that, that we are all fallible human beings. Uh, we, we all uh, have strengths and limitations. This, the third is dedication. You're, you're dedicated to, to what you do. And the fourth is passion. And so I think when you are working with very bright, very capable people, to the extent that you focus on what's important to them, that you earn the right to proceed, and that you do so with a certain aura of integrity, humility, dedication, and passion, then uh, the relationships tend to evolve uh, quite easily and quite naturally. Yeah, that, that uh, all great points. You know, it's uh, had a couple of athletes on, on the podcast and they, it's similar in terms of how they just approach a game, right? Like it's, it's the relationships, it's the hard work, it's the integrity, it's, and it's do what you're, you say you're going to do. So it's, uh, it spans industries really and spans sort of domains, no question. I guess before we sort of go too much further, what is the elevator pitch that that you would deliver in terms of in terms of what you do in your in your company, the Covenant Group, what the Covenant Group does? Well, first and foremost, the work we do uh, is generally speaking with people who are in a role where relationships matter. And where relationships matter, so too do conversations. And, and you mentioned that we do a lot of work in financial services, Darcy, and that's probably our dominant vertical, working with, with financial institutions, distribution organizations, and their financial advisors. And we've educated and coached over 35,000 financial advisors in the last 25 years. We also work in other verticals, though, uh, that are in an advisory capacity. Uh, you know, yours is a good example, real estate, uh, but also law, accounting, consulting, and in the ecosystems that, that tend to surround uh, those sectors because they, too, are building relationships. So it might be technology companies as an example. And where relationships matter it's not about having an elevator pitch. 
The, the concept of an elevator pitch is really one that was based on a different era and a different type of selling. It was one where primarily sales involved product need matching and you had to pitch your product. You had to get people's interest. Where relationships matter, what's important is conversations. And the first conversation you have is a client attraction conversation. And the purpose of the client attraction conversation is to invite someone who fits your ideal client profile to engage with you in the buying cycle or the sales process. And, and one example of that, it, and, and you would know this well, is that when you meet someone for the first time, people will often ask you, Darcy, what do you do? That, that's a question that we get asked all the time. And if we come back to financial services, what's interesting, Darcy, is most financial advisors fumble in addressing that question. And it's not a function of how many years they've been in the business. I've encountered uh, financial advisors who have been doing it for 30 or 40 years or more, who when I ask them, what do you do? They say, you know, I really struggle with that. Most people, when asked the question, what do you do, tell you the solution they provide. I'm a financial advisor. I'm a wealth manager. I'm an estate planner. I do tax planning. Well, that's not particularly relevant to people because lots of people do that and that doesn't differentiate you. So one of the financial advisors with whom we work, his name is Dean Harder. And Dean is someone who we've coached. Uh, I, I, I might jump in here and say, because I was going to bring this guy up. He's an absolute legend. Yeah, he I've did. said legend before, but he's unbelievable. Yeah. And this is, the, this is an exact example. I'm glad you brought him up of this certain thing that it's unbelievable how he approaches it. So carry on, sorry to interrupt, but Dean Harder getting a shout out, um, you know, from uh, on the podcast, I'll flip him a note, but th his approach is amazing. He is, he is amazing. And he is the master of conversations with the people whom he wants to serve. So when we started working together, Dean was 48. That was six years ago. He's now 54. And what Dean's passionate about is helping people retire financially secure and able to live their retirement dream. So his ideal client is five to 10 years from retirement, you know, typically 50 to 60. So when Dean meets someone like that and they say, Dean, what do you do? He always answers the same way. He'll say, thank you for asking. Before I answer that question, would you mind if I asked you a question? And most people readily say yes. And you'll say, do you plan to retire someday? Now, Darcy, as you know, people will answer that question in one of three ways. Yeah, I can't wait. You know, uh, to no, I, I plan to be carried out with my boots still on. And that's me. And then third, um, uh, I don't know. And when people answer, I don't know, it's usually they don't know whether they can retire or not. When somebody answers yes, and then, then Dean will then ask him a series of questions. He'll ask, well, tell me, what, what does your retirement dream look like? What do you, and, and he'll draw them out. And that conversation might take a couple of minutes or it might take 20 to 30 minutes because people will readily talk about that. And it, again, Dean's applying two principles of influence, focus on the other person. And secondly, earn the right to proceed. The first decision you want to make, people make, is, they, is to engage with you. So when it comes back and they say to, to Dean, so Dean, what do you do? Again, he'll say, thank you for asking. You always acknowledge the other person. I love helping people. I love helping people five to 10 years from retirement move from the majority to the minority. Only a small number of people will be able to retire financially secure and able to live their retirement dream. I would love to show you how this works. It's incredible. I want to call him right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that really highlights um, a number of things with regard to your question about it. It's not, not so much having an elevator pitch. It's having a client attraction conversation. And in the client attraction conversation, you're, you're really first and foremost applying two forms of marketing. The first is permission marketing. Whatever you say, the other person says, that's interesting. Tell me more about that or what do you mean? In other words, 
you create curiosity. So when Dean says, I love helping people move from the majority to the minority, that's a bit of a, a, a twist. And, and, and it creates a, an element of curiosity. And then the second form of marketing is aspirational. You appeal to what's important to people, to their goals. So when Dean's established that that person wants to retire, now he talks about how you, they can achieve their retirement dream, what's important to them. That's key. But I want to come back to one other element that we didn't illustrate. In our model in the client attraction conversation, there are really four parts, and they, they are framed you, me, us, we. So the you is based on those two principles of influence. Focus on the other person and earn the right to proceed. And you do that by asking questions and listening and focusing on what's important to them. What are their goals? The B is your transition statement. When they turn to you and ask, what do you do? Thank you for asking. I love helping people. I love helping people like you, five to 10 years from retirement, move from the majority to the minority. The us is then a story you tell. So typically what Dean would do is he would tell us a story, 45 seconds to 120 seconds of someone in a situation similar to the person he's talking to, who too wanted to retire. And, and, and Dean was able to help him or help them as a couple facilitate that. And then the us is your statement of intent. If we could do that for you, would that be a basis for us to work together? So good. There's so much there. You know, I, I think back, um, it, you can see how the light bulb would go off. You know, it's almost like people say, tell a story because because people, st- you know, all of a sudden then they almost close their eyes and think about, they can see it, they can visualize it. And what Dean's doing is is definitely, you know, focusing on what's important to the other person but then putting them in the shoes of like making their dream come true in their mind almost. Right. It's, it's a, it's such a brilliant approach, but it's also, you know, I've thought about it quite a bit. It's, it's a difficult thing to do in that way. It's very difficult. It is. And I think one of the challenges in, in business and in life is that we confuse familiarity and mastery. And because we're familiar with what we do, we don't take the time to master it. And as you would well know, as, a, as an athlete, great athletes focus an inordinate amount of time and energy on mastering each aspect of what they do. And, and yet so many successful people do not achieve the kind of breakthrough performance that is within their reach because they have not moved from familiarity to mastery. I'll I'll give you an example. I was coaching a a, a young advisor like you. Um, He's he's the same age as you. And uh, he's in Las Vegas. And uh, the year before we started working together, he had earned $1.7 million, 37 years of age. And he was pretty cocky. So we were going through some aspects of the mastery of the conversational environment with, with people you know. And in financial services, as an example, Darcy, typically people choose their financial advisor within two degrees of separation. Either it's someone in their social circle they know, or they are introduced to that person from someone in their social circle they know. And so getting introductions is a very important aspect of how financial advisors build their business. It's an important aspect of how most people build their business. And so I, I was taking uh, this um, young advisor through our five-step process for obtaining introductions. And he stopped me with some irritation in his voice and said, Norm, I know how to get referrals. And I said to him, first and foremost, take the word referral out of your vocabulary. When your doctor refers you to someone, it's because you have a problem. He thinks you have a problem. And so he refers you to a specialist. When you ask for referrals, people think, who do I know who has a problem? Who do I know who needs a financial advisor? We don't share that with many people in our social circle. Yet people make introductions every day. Darcy, if you and I were at a social gathering, having a conversation, as someone came up who you knew, would you have any hesitation introducing me? Of course not. Yeah. People make introductions every day. So I said to him, 
It's not about mastering getting referrals. It's mastering the art of obtaining introductions. And you know at least 20, each, each of your best clients knows at least 20 people who are like them. Those are the people you want to get in front of. So part, part of the challenge is that, that we get to a point where we've, we've gained familiarity with what we do, yet we have not mastered it. And, and taking that additional step makes all the difference in the world. Athletes are always great examples for this type of thing, um, for you know that idea of focusing on mastery, no question. But if, you, if we step back to sort of where relationships matter and so do conversations, one of the things I'd be interested in, maybe it's not relevant, but is how has technology changed that sort of conversation and has it? Oh, very much. It, it has dramatically changed it. Uh, and, and thank you for asking. One example of that is that when, when people make decisions, they triangulate. They look for three or more sources to validate their decision making. So just as hundreds of years ago, early navigators learned that the human eye deceives. And so the print- That's not when you started coaching, is it? <laughs> yeah, just about. <laughs> yeah, I remember those days. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and they, they, they re- recognized that the human eye deceived, so they would identify two other points of reference to judge the distance of a foreign object. That's how the human mind works. So when, when we are faced with a decision, uh, let's say, am I going to do business with you? One part of that triangulation is my intuition, the, the, the impression I have of you. Typically, as we know, the best form of marketing is word of mouth. So mm-hmm. I, you know, I was lucky enough to get introduced to you by someone who you knew and respected. And, and that started our relationship off. And as a result, we were fortunate enough to get you as a client. Um, so I- introductions really matter. But the third way that people triangulate today is to go to the internet. They Google you. And as you know, Darcy, when, when, when someone Googles you, the first thing that comes up typically is your LinkedIn profile. Because LinkedIn spends hundreds of millions of dollars controlling the algorithms on Google that bring them up first. And so people will, will read your profile. They'll look at, they'll look at your picture. And, and they look at your picture to say, you know, is this somebody I could relate to? They look at the background, at, 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 at what, what your profile says about you. And that speaks volumes. So the way you manage the before is critical to the degree to which people will view you as trustworthy, credible, relatable, and likable. One other element of that, human beings are by nature rationalizing rather than rational. We form judgments of people within the first 30 seconds to three minutes of meeting them. And those judgments typically are based upon superficial criteria. How someone looks, how they speak, their tone, their tempo, their mannerisms, uh, the degree to which um, they represent themselves. All of that is superficial criteria, but they form long lasting impressions. So you want to manage that initial impression and you can do it before. When we meet someone for the first time, there are four things that are really important to control. The first is framing. Framing is the way in which information is presented. The second is timing. Timing is the order in which it's presented. The third is positioning. Positioning is the degree to which people view you negatively, neutral, or favorably. In other words, the degree to which you can move people along a continuum from negatively disposed to favorably disposed. That's what advertising is all about. The fourth is separation. The degree to which you differentiate yourself in a way that people say, I've never met someone like that, or I've never had this kind of an experience. Those four things are critical, and they're particularly so when you first meet someone. So let's talk about framing as an example. 
if you introduce me to somebody, you're going to, I would assume, and, and I know you've introduced me to a number of people, so I know this, you're going to make every effort to put my best foot forward to present me in the most positive light. Is that a fair statement? Sure. Yeah, that, I would say that's a fair yeah. statement, so, depending on the day. But yeah, <laughs> I would say that's a fair statement. So word of mouth is the best form of, of uh, advertising. But then people are going to Google me. Now, as you know, we've invested uh, a lot of time and money in uh, our social media presence and, and in our website. And we've worked with people like Dr. Deborah Jasper, who's one of the foremost communications experts uh, in North America, probably in the world, around how we present ourselves. So, so Deborah did a LinkedIn makeover for me, and it increased my social selling index by 35%, and it was already high. You know, on that note, like I'll ju- jump in there. It, she's great. Uh, you know, I, I personally haven't worked with her, but she definitely, she has a PhD in micro storytelling and, and brings it to the digital world. And it's, it's very impressive. And in what seems quite obvious when you say it is, you know, the tri- triangulation, which is intuition, word of mouth, and then the internet, everyone's LinkedIn profile, not everyone, but is basically a resume, but that's not reflective of you today and to your point it's of those three outside of word of mouth i guess it's going to be the most valuable thing so for me the, the light bulb kind of went off and i'm, I'm not going to say my linkedin profile is is uh, totally up the curve but you know it it is very important because important. you can tell a story that you want to be told other than i worked here i worked here i did this exactly that's right so framing the way in which People frame you the way in which you introduce me. What uh, my LinkedIn profile states, uh, our our website, um, all of those things are critical to timing. And so timing is the order in which information is presented. So when, when, when I meet someone for the first time, I don't have to sell myself. I can apply the two principles of influence, focus on the other person, make them the center of the experience and earn the right to proceed. And and so generally speaking, when I meet someone for the first time, they're already favorably disposed to me. I'm already positioned. And to some degree, often to a large degree, because of what the introducer has has shared about what we do, and, and they've gone to our to my LinkedIn profile, to our website, they've looked at videos, they already see a separation. So the conversation becomes completely about them. And and typically what happens in our business, we work all over North America and internationally. And as you know, most of the coaching that, that we do is either by phone or a Zoom meeting, especially today with COVID-19, but it's always been that way for years. Because, we, because we're working with people remotely. Uh, we've been doing that for 20 plus years. But when I meet someone for the first time, the, the initial conversation will take 20 to 30 minutes. And, and, and they will make a five to six figure financial decision at the end of that. It, up until pre-COVID times, or, or, or pre-COVID times, the first time I would meet, actually meet a client would be when either I would go to see them or they would come to see us. Today, it's, it's, uh, it's typically on a Zoom call. So all of that matters. And the way you manage each aspect is critical. Certainly. Like it's, uh, it, it's just an interesting way to think about connection. I think about it quite a lot as just how you can connect with people and establish a network outside of your current network which you know new networks are social like look at even had at kids you know i have a nephew who plays minecraft or i think it's minecraft i, I don't know i'm not i'm not a gamer but they have friends that they've never met yeah. on minecraft like it's it's only going to become more magnified right and so you know our generations that are a little bit removed for that have to keep an eye on that um you know this idea of technology being enabling your network and your network coming from your use of technology, where and how you use it. It's a game changer and it's only going to expand. You put this idea in my mind um, is this idea of networking versus net weaving. 
you know, we all kind of know what networking is and there's tactics around how to network. You know, if I think about myself personally, I would put myself more in the net weaving bucket, which is, you know, trying to make connections for other people that would be beneficial for that person. And, you know, if something positive comes out of it, that's great, but it's really not your intention. But how do you think about tying networking and net weaving together and, and just explain maybe the, the differences in the two? Well, networking is based upon the premise, what can you do for me? Net weaving on the supposition, what can I do for you? And you're right. You are a natural networker and net weaver. And you've built your network in large part through your gift of net weaving, of, of doing things for others. And the, the, the most powerful form of influence is reciprocity. You, you give to get. And so people who build powerful networks typically have distinguishing characteristics. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell talks about it uh, uh, in The Tipping Point, that it takes only a small number of people to create a revolution. Uh, and those people typically have three characteristics in common. One is that they are mavens. Maven is a Yiddish word that means accumulator of knowledge, a wise person. The second is they are natural connectors. They, they bring people together. And the third is they're great salespeople. They have an ability to influence or move others. So those are all distinguishing characteristics. Um, with regard to networking and net weaving, Adam Grant in his classic work on give and take highlights the fact that um, you, you have uh, three types of people. You have givers, you have takers, and you have matchers. So givers are naturally inclined to do for others. Takers are naturally inclined to do for themselves. And matchers, it's quid pro quo. You do something for me, I'll do something for you. And often, you know, one of the things that, that Grant wanted to identify was who is likely to be most successful, givers, takers, or matchers. Are you familiar with, with his work, Darcy? Yeah, I am. I actually have a funny story about Adam yeah. Grant, but I could, I could save it to later. So you know it. So typically when you ask people who's least likely to be successful, give or take or matcher, people will say, well, a taker or a matcher. And it's actually givers. Givers are the least likely to be successful. And then you ask who's most likely to be successful. And the answer is givers. And so it's paradoxical. So how can a giver be the least likely to be successful and the most likely to be successful? Well, Therein lies the challenge. Um, if you were a giver who gives of yourself unceasingly and, and without qualification, you're going to exhaust yourself. Why? Because in nature, opposites attract. Who is a giver most likely to attract? Takers. So successful givers learn to discern to whom they will give. And so the most successful people are those who are naturally inclined to give. They are net workers and net weavers, and they discern how they're going to expend their time, their energy, their creativity, and their intelligence in giving. Because doing it without qualification, you're just going to exhaust yourself. That's so good. It's logical. I'll, I'll jump in quickly. It's not, not to shine the light here, but Adam Grant, I'll tell you a quick story. So I was driving to a friend's wedding in, um, in Michigan. It's about a five hour drive. And so I put on a podcast and it was Adam Grant. And I was listening to him. I think it was after he launched give and take his book. And so I, I you know, I listened to that. And then another one, I, li I literally listened to it for four hours and I got to this wedding. I was a little bit late. I threw on my suit and I ran down into sort of where the reception was going to be. And I, a bunch of my sort of grad school colleagues were there that I hadn't seen in a number of years. And I was telling them, Oh, yeah, I was listening to Adam Grant. You know, he, this guy's unbelievable. He's talking about that and just going through the whole thing and they're, you know, pretending to be interested. And <laughs> then, and I went on for who knows, like 10 minutes and I turned around. This is no joke. And the guy that was getting married was, uh, he was working in the White House. He was kind of like a, you know, a, a political figure. And um, I turned around and who was standing behind me? 
Adam Grant. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so I was telling him, man, I was just telling this story, but in, in, anyways, we hit it off that day. He's, he's, he's a great he, guy. He is a great guy. He's a funny yeah. star. And, yeah. and very humble. You know, just that. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Big time. So if we switch gears maybe a little bit, you've told me before that you're a big reader. So what, what types of things do you, do you read? Well, you know, it's interesting how our, our lives shape us. Um, so I was born in Ireland and uh, uh, my, my birthday is January 1st. And uh, I was born in Northern Ireland and in the UK educational system, you start school in your birth year. So I started school when I was in grade three and, uh, and, and they didn't have kindergarten. So I started in grade one. We came to Canada when I was seven and uh, when uh, they tested me to go into school, they, uh, I tested at a grade five level, but you know, I would be in class with 10 year olds. So the principal who was a wise man, I didn't realize at the time said, you know, for boys, it's important to be in the same age group because if you put Norm with older kids, he's going to be at a disadvantage. If you put him in the same age group, in fact, he, he's probably going to be the oldest person in the class or one of the oldest, it's going to be an advantage. And that turned out to be a very formative decision in my life from a developmental point of view in terms of you know, the way in which young boys interact with each other. And, and you would know that well as an athlete, uh, Darcy, and uh, that's another story. But what it meant was... Well, I, I have three boys, and the only way they interact is punching, they, they pound fighting, each other. and, then, and, yeah, and, exactly. and then hugging after. I'm like, Do that? I don't think that is how it usually... But yeah. It is, yeah. And when, when we moved, from the time I was seven until I was 18, we moved 12 times. So I got into my share of fights. and But because I was three years ahead of my class, I was bored. So I started reading. So for example, when I was eight, I read what, when I got, got into grade 10, was the prescribed or the assigned history book for, for the grade 10 uh, hi history program. So I scored 100% on history in, in grade 10. I'd re I read that book first when I was eight. So, and, and of course, we didn't get our first television uh, until uh, I was 10. Uh, and so I've always been a reader. I probably read six to eight hours a day. And my reading is, is fairly eclectic. So I love history. I love political issues. I love economics. I love psychology. I love philosophy. I, I've read probably just about every kind of religion uh, at various times. So it's just always interested me. And, and, uh, and I think I was really blessed in that I got introduced to that very early. And uh, so it became a habit. And as you know, like any habit, uh, if, if you reinforce it, it, it has its own reward. And, and you, so you continue to do more and more of it. Right. Yeah. It compounds on itself, reading particularly. So I'd add, add one other element to your question, because I think it's a very important sure. question. Uh, what, one of the things that I make every effort to do is read and learning about things that are antithetical or opposite to my belief system or things that I, I don't understand or, um, it did challenge my way of thinking. I, and this actually on Thursday, I'm having a, a, a Zoom dinner with um, five uh, friends that we've been meeting for the last 24 years. I'm the only non-PhD in that group. And uh, they, we, we've been together for 24 years. And uh, we formed a study group 24 years ago. It, it went from being a think tank to a field tank because People have been through so many different things together in the last 24 years. But one of the, the members of that group is a longtime friend and someone I care about deeply, very bright. One of these people that you touched on earlier, he always thinks he's the smartest person in the room. And he's often wrong, but he has extreme confidence in his own point of view. And when we have conversations, I'll often say to him, help me understand your point of view, because... When you listen to people, you have to listen at, at two levels. You have to listen for what they say, and then you have to listen at right angles. You have to listen for the logic that underlies what they say. And when you listen for the logic that underlies what they say, now you can get a better understanding 
of their cognitive capability, their judgment, their reasoning, their problem solving. So it's not about whether you agree or disagree with the argument. It's about the soundness or the logic that pervades the point that they're making. What tends to happen, Darcy, is because we are, are judgmental and rationalizing rather than rational, if people present a point of view that we disagree with, we react emotionally. We don't listen to the logic that pervades their point of view. And it's only when we understand their logic that we can fully embrace their right to feel that way and then, then look for mutual understanding. That's a difficult thing to do in a way because it's sometimes painful to hear the other side of the argument and you reject it. It's almost a Charlie Munger, you know, his approach, and which is, you know, spend more time thinking about the counter argument than your your argument, right? Because yeah. it's likely that you're not right. But if you're thorough and you're sort of figuring out the counter, then you'll come to a, a, a great conclusion. So one of the things that I think is is very interesting about what you do and how you think about just life is is the people that made the big impact in your life. Um, and you know we don't we don't need to go into to detail here necessarily. Is that the way that they've made the biggest impact? is that they've revealed your own greatness, you know, and not to say anyone's greater than anyone else, but you know, that, that could apply to anybody. They reveal your greatness. So who are maybe some of the people that have done that? And, or, or maybe more importantly, how do you do that for your clients? That, the statement you made is, is very telling. Uh, it's, not a, it's not greatness in relation to others, it's one's own greatness. It's not about comparison. It's about realizing the fullness of our own potential. And uh, you know, one of the, uh, you asked about my uh, interest in reading and, and for a period of time, I was really taken by the classics. And, and uh, you know, one of the, the stories that really touched me was of Narcissus. And, and Narcissus was a young man who fell in love with his own image. And each day he would go to gaze at his image reflected in a pool. And one day he became so entranced, he leaned too far and fell into the pool. Unable to swim, he drowned. When the gods came to that pool, because the pool was known for the, the, the freshness of its water, after Narcissus died, the water turned saline or salty. And, and the God said to the pool, what happened? Your water was so pure. And, and, and now it has lost its taste. And the pool responded, when that young man looked at, at me, I saw my own greatness reflected back. And when he died, the salt is the, from the tears that have come out of my eyes. So when people look at you, when they see their own greatness reflected back, that, that is very powerful. And I think that there are people in our lives who are able to see the potential that we cannot yet see or have not yet expressed. And they can have a profound impact on our lives. So, uh, you know, one of the, I mean, I've had, I've been, very blessed in having a, a number of people like that in my life. Um, and when I came into high school, I, I matured late in life. Uh, I had a younger brother who played professional football for a number of years, and and we were uh, 14 months apart. And in Ireland, that's known as Irish twins. We did everything together growing up. And when when we were in high school, when I was in grade 10 and he was in grade 9, I was 5'8 and weighed 125 pounds. He was 6'2 and weighed 210 pounds. And I had to scrimmage against him every day. And that was one of the, the best things that happened to me because when, when you're outweighed by 85 pounds, you have, to, you have to find other ways to move someone. And, and so I, under, I learned about leverage and about dealing with the limitations I had in a way that, that could overcome them. When, when I went into grade 11, I, in grade 10, I had a, 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 um, an English teacher. His name was Jack Andrews. And I was very good in English because I'd read a lot. And, and he took a liking to me. And then in grade 11, when I went out for the senior football team, he was the defensive coach. Now, I had grown about eight inches in that year. So I'd gone from 5'8 
to 6'2", but I'd only put on about 15 pounds. So I was a pool cue. I was really skinny, but I had a lot of drive. And uh, the position I really wanted to play uh, was defensive end. And so he was a defensive coach. So he gave me a chance to play. And I was outweighed by 50 or 60 pounds, but I had a relentless engine. I just wouldn't stop. And so I ended up having a very good year. And he he gave me tremendous support. And that the consequence of that, because I think otherwise, if it had not been for him, I probably would have dropped out uh, uh, of playing football. And so in my last year, I was an all-city, all-star, uh, uh, and it, it made a difference. But what was interesting was he was my English teacher in grade 10 and again in grade 13. And in grade 13, my parents separated and my father was an alcoholic and uh, a wonderful man, but uh, typical of um, kind of the Irish uh, characterization. He was an alcoholic and a philanderer. And so my parents separated. I was very close to my dad and I went to live with my dad and my dad's life was really falling apart. And so it was really hard to keep things together. In that year, I was not only a, an all-star in football, but also a, an Ontario scholar, finished fourth out of 283 students in my graduating class. And a lot of that had to do with people like Jack Andrews. That's awesome. That's uh, a lot of resilience in that, in that uh, mind and body of yours, for sure. That's a, that's a great story. It's a great, you know, to bring out the best in people and and sort of believe in them when, you know, they may or may not believe in themselves. The other the other thing, not to take it back to sports at all, is learning to play small when others are big yeah. is painful at the time potentially, but it definitely, you know, once everyone sort of get hits their growth spurt, now you're you have the and this can apply to life, right? When everyone hits their growth spurt, now you're on a, you've learned to play gritty. You've got, you know, the relentless engine and they've learned to play big and now you're going to have the advantage. So it's a, it's kind of an interesting analogy to sports and life generally. So that's a great, great story. Um, I guess the, the, maybe the last thing to wind it up, I ask a, a very curious question and if people listen to the podcast, maybe they'll they'll catch on, but otherwise people that haven't will be caught by surprise. And I'm not presumptuous enough to think that everyone listens. So uh, the question is, as we kind of wind it, wind it up, this has been great, by the way, it's uh, super insightful. I want to take a lot of these, you know, great nuggets of wisdom and information and splice them up for people to, to read, learn, and hopefully share. But the, the, the final question I always ask, if there was one song that you would pick to sing karaoke to, what would it be? Oh boy. Now that, that's a really tough one. Um, it's a tough one. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, everyone in my family is musical except me and everyone in my family when they're around has music on except me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, I don't know very many songs, but I think that that if I probably had to, uh, and this is really dating me, it would be, uh, I, I'm not even sure it's the right title, My Way, that when Frank Sinatra used to sing that song. Yeah. Because, um, I, I think ultimately... I think that is the right title. It's a great song. Yeah. I think we have to chart our own way and, and, and find what uh, what in life is uniquely suited to us. And, and often the, the paradox, Darcy, is that that requires compromise. It requires adjustment, uh, adaptation. And what is seemingly the, the correct path or, or the, what will be the, the chosen path often turns not in life to be what is the one we we inevitably find ourselves on. So, for example, um, you know, I mentioned that when I was young, I was very, I was a reader and I was really interested in politics and economics. And up until the time I was about 15, I thought that I would um, 
do a political science and economics degree, and then I would go to law. And I was really interested in getting involved in politics. And when I was 15, my best friend tried to commit suicide. And it was a, it was a real attempt. Fortunately, he took three bottles of pills when his parents went to work and his mother was feeling ill that day and she came back and found him at 20, after nine in the morning, called an ambulance, they pumped his stomach, but he was institutionalized. And because I was his best friend, his psychiatrist asked to see me to, to, because he wanted to gain more understanding of my friend. And at that time, I, my parents were in a desperately unhappy marriage and uh, it, was, it was not a happy household. And uh, I went to see this psychiatrist probably four or five times. The first time to talk about my friend, the other times more uh, to talk about me. And I was profoundly impacted by um, his uh, sensitivity and, and, and understanding. And so I started reading everything I could about psychology. And, uh, and so I decided to take psychology and, and to become a clinical psychologist. I knew that I, I, didn't, I didn't want to be a doc, medical doctor, but I was really intrigued by psychology. But at the same time, I was playing football. And even though I developed late, uh, when I was playing football, by the time I was ready to graduate, I was about 255. And, and in those days, that was big. It's not big anymore in the NFL, but um, in, in those days, it was big. But that neither of those things happened. I didn't become a clinical psychologist. I decided not to play professional football. I ended up going into financial services more by accident than by design. And it turned out to be really uh, transformative because it was a great experience and it led me uh, to hiring my first coach when I was 26, to getting into this field when I was in my late 20s. And, uh, and this work... Uh, I find tremendously fulfilling. And in a sense, it allows me to only do what only I can do. And uh, so our life often doesn't follow a, a direct line. It evolves. It, it takes a, a different pattern, different course. And to the degree that we're open and adaptive to that, uh, then uh, when we find what we are uniquely suited to do, it's sometimes in an area that we did not fully anticipate and yet allows for full expression. Yeah, that's that's a great, super interesting and soothing kind of story and, and where you ended up. And I think it's a valuable lesson, you know, and the big thing is being open to doing it when these opportunities pop up, right? Like that's that in itself is a difficult thing to do. So yeah. that's a great place to to wind it up. Uh it's been an absolute pleasure. I hope more people reach out to you after hearing it, but either way, I appreciate your time. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's been great, Norm. Thanks. Thank you. I really appreciate it, Darcy. I really appreciate you. You have a real gift. You take care of yourself. Thanks, Norm. Take care. Bye-bye. Your time is valuable. So thanks for joining us for this episode of Venture and Gains, where we connect great people, ideas, and opportunities. It's this idea of net weaving versus networking. Remember that you can find more episodes at VentureandGains.com. And if you know any entrepreneurs, emerging asset managers, or fascinating people that you think would be a good fit, flip us a note and let us know. Stay well. Darcy McConvey is a director of private capital markets at Graybrook Realty Partners and is registered under Graybrook Securities, Inc. The opinions and statements expressed by Darcy and the Venture and Gains guests are their own and they do not reflect the opinions of Graybrook Realty Partners or Graybrook Securities. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Investment decisions. Investment decisions. Investment decisions. Investment decisions. Investment decisions. Investment decisions.